subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you never miss any video lesson from Rao's IA Study Circle. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading from your UPSC perspective. Today, let us discuss the important news which has appeared in the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 22nd May 2020. The news to be discussed has been displayed on your screen and timestamping for the same has been provided in the description box below. Dear students, we at Rao's IA Study Circle have created the eLearn platform for students who are eager to learn and excel in the civil services examination. Our eLearn platform have provided study materials in print format, video formats, as well as compiled MCQs for the students to test their acquired learning. Now the print version includes Focus Magazine, Prelims Compass Magazine of different subjects, as well as the Budget and Economic Survey. And also the compilation contains previous year question papers asked in prelims as well as mains examination. Now videos on eLearn platform includes daily news simplified videos, analysis of economic survey done by Baswasa, GS mains 2019 question analysis and discussion based on the question asked in the mains of 2019, as well as videos on prelims practice which includes subject wise videos as well as month wise current affairs questions. Now these study materials can be accessed free of cost at our website that is at elearn.rauis.com. Now today I want to highlight about the importance of videos on prelims practice which we make at Rao's IES study circle. Now the topics selected for prelims practice questions are either subject wise questions such as economy, polity, science and technology etc or they are month wise current affairs videos for example current affairs video for December 2019. Now most of these topics have already been discussed in DNS videos of that particular month and also covered in Focus magazine of that particular month. Further, questions from these topics have also appeared as prelims test series 2020 current affairs test. So the purpose of providing videos for prelims practice is a sort of revision of the most important topics for that particular month. Further, while discussing question in these videos, we will not only guide you through our various sources where these topics have been covered but will also explain you the relevance and importance from UPSC perspective about the questions which we have selected. So the whole idea is to give you complete guidance through these learning tools which we have collectively created at Rao's IES Study Circle. These learning tools have been provided free of cost at our eLearn portal where you can log in at any time. And if you have not logged in then we request you to log in by giving your bare minimum credentials as it will open windows of knowledge and learning important to clear the coveted civil services examination. So on this note, let us start our today's discussion. Now this news appears as an editorial on page number 6. It says, Keeping the peace. India and China must end tensions on the border by clarifying the line of actual control. Now this news with respect to India and China and their tensions on border has been discussed in detail yesterday by Mangal sir and also by Nagin sir in the video dated 20th May 2020 where Nagin sir discussed in detail with respect to the border disputes between India and China. Now yesterday Mangal sir explained that one of the main problems with respect to border disputes between India and China is about their perception of boundary line. So China thinks that McDonald line should be the line of boundary between India and China whereas according to India it thinks that Johnson line should be the border between India and China. And it is because of this confusion or difference of perception between India and China, the border dispute in the area of Aksai Chin has emerged. So these two analysis done by Mangal sir and Nagend sir has explained in detail about the India-China border disputes. Now this particular editorial highlights about a particular area of conflict that is the DBO road. That is the Dabuk Shok Dalat Beg Oldie road and this road is important First of all because it connects Leh to Karakoram Pass and secondly this road has also a landing strip at the DBO road at 16,000 feet. Now all these road activities done by India in its own region that is within our own border is somehow irking China and China seems not very happy with India's road construction activity although in India's own region which China had earlier done. Now this sort of hegemony by China might lead to certain skirmishes between the armies of India as well as China. So in this regard this editorial says 
that now is the time to keep peace and not to fight among ourselves specifically with respect to border dispute so in this editorial you must know about the dbo road and its geographical importance as it connects leh to karakoram pass now here it's interesting to note that although india is conducting road construction activity within its own region that is within our own border china has accused the indian army to attempt to unilaterally change the status of line of actual control and this has what irked the indian side further to escalate the tension china sent troops to obstruct road construction activity by india in the dbo region so all these activities by china has led to increase in temperature at the border area specifically with respect to road construction activity at dbo road that is dabok shok dolat beg old d road as this road connects leh to karakoram pass now this topic becomes important primarily from the point of location in geography you must know about leh as well as you must know that the dbo road connects leh to karakoram pass which is close to aksai chin now as of now china has the possession of aksai chin however india claims aksai chin to be part of its own territory so we can say the whole problem between india and china is with respect to difference of perception of boundary lines as well as acquired territory mostly by china so in the backdrop of india china border dispute this editorial highlights that prime minister narendra modi and president xi jinping of china have both agreed that differences should not be allowed to escalate to disputes further in this regard a clear message was sent to both the militaries that is the military of india as well as china to abide by the detailed protocols already in place such as those which were agreed between india and china in 2005 as well as 2013 now these protocols regulate the activities of troops in contested zones that lie between both sides that is india and china as well as over overlapping claims lines of the undefined line of actual control so in this regard this editorial has highlighted that both sides that is china and india should not escalate the tension further and should rather take a step back and use existing channels to sort out their differences now india china disputes has always been in news and has been asked by upsc at various times now this particular question was asked in the year 2017 in gs paper 2 the question was china is using its economic relations and positive trade surplus as tools to develop potential military power status in asia in light of this statement discuss its impact on india as her neighbor and this question was asked in 150 words so we see that different aspects of dispute between india and china and also hegemony of china in the entire asia region has been asked by upsc continuously now this particular question was asked in the year 2014 it says with respect to south china sea maritime territorial disputes and rising tension affirm the need for safeguarding maritime security to ensure freedom of navigation and over flight throughout the region so in this context discuss the bilateral issues between india and china so this question was asked in a much larger context with respect to south china sea maritime territorial disputes as well as rising tension between these two countries in those times further in the year 2013 a question was asked with respect to string of pearls it said what do you understand by the string of pearls how does it impact india briefly outline the steps taken by india to counter the string of pearls theory of china now according to the string of pearls theory of china china increased their activities in the indian ocean region and these activities were with respect to military capabilities of china as well as their commercial relations with countries falling on the indian ocean region for example china helped in building the sri lankan port of hambantota further china also helped in building the godar port of pakistan and also the sitwe port of myanmar so this military as well as commercial network along the indian ocean region was considered as string of pearls and in response to the string of pearls theory by china india came up with look east policy so this was the question asked by upsc in the year 2013 so we understand that the border disputes between india and china specifically with respect to the disputes along line of actual control between the two countries 
becomes a point of concern as well as dispute. So these aspects becomes important from your examination perspective specifically with respect to GS paper 2 under international relations. So in this regard question in your mains examination can be asked under GS paper 2 as well as certain prelims question can be asked with respect to Aksai Chin, Karakoram Pass, the road between Leh to Karakoram Pass as well as strategic location along the borders between India and China from your geography perspective. Hence, this topic gets covered under both prelims as well as your mains examination. The next news to be discussed appears on page number 6 as a lead article. It says the lockdown has highlighted stark inequalities. Instead of embracing the welfare state path, the BJP government is encouraging greater privatization. Now this article says that because of COVID-19 epidemic, it has created uneven impact and this unevenness is specifically visible with respect to class differentiation between haves and the have-nots. Further, this differentiation between haves and have-nots is also clearly visible throughout the world including India. So overall this article says that post COVID-19 or because of the epidemic of COVID-19, it has increased social inequality within the country. Now according to the author, this has happened because Indian lockdown has been the longest as well as toughest and a bare minimum notice of 4 hours was provided by the Indian government prior to lockdown. So this has impacted the vulnerable section of the population the most, especially those who are dependent on daily wage or who can be said to be daily wage earners employed in the informal sector. So in this regard, the author says that without safety net for poor sections of the society, their dependency on the government has increased and this has also led to greater social inequality in the society. Further, the extension of national lockdown further devastated their economic condition with respect to daily wage earners as well as other sections of the society engaged in informal economy. So this article says that because of lack of any job, there is neither income, food, nor any proper shelter for these daily wage earners. Now the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy has estimated that 140 million people have lost their job in this lockdown. So it is in this regard this article highlights that despite economic growth of India, socio-economic inequality in the country has not reduced. And this socio-economic inequality in the country has worsened especially after the COVID-19 national lockdown. And in this regard, according to the author, India has failed to maintain balanced equitable as well as inclusive growth. So the author highlights that balanced equitable and inclusive growth in the country is quite missing. Further the CMIE also predicts that unemployment in the country will further worsen in coming time. So in this regard the author has highlighted three aspects with respect to the above situation. First how has COVID-19 exposed and accentuated the existing socio-economic inequalities. Second poor response of central government to alleviate the distress caused to the people engaged in informal sector of the economy. And third, what should have been done by the government to ease the situation for such people engaged in informal economy or dependent on daily wage earnings. Now coming to the first aspect, the author has says that the COVID-19 situation as well as the lockdown caused because of the COVID-19 pandemic has increased socio-economic inequality especially between those people who are engaged in the formal sector and those people who are engaged in the informal sector of the Indian economy. So for such people who are at the higher levels of socio-economic ladder, life for them is comparatively easier as compared to those people who are living on mere daily wages. Now some of these people in the formal sector or in the higher levels of socio-economic ladder are able to work from home. So they do not have to worry on their salary aspect as they have a regular source of income. Their only cause of worry is with respect to exposure of the virus. So since they are able to work from home, so their exposure level is comparatively less as compared to such people who are engaged in the informal sector of the economy or in other words who cannot work from home. So overall, those people who are at the higher levels of socio-economic ladder are comparatively better as compared to those people who are engaged in the informal sector and mostly for such workers who live on daily wage. So for such people engaged in the informal sector, this article says that this lockdown has created not only loss of livelihood, 
but has also increased unemployment for such people because of lack of any economic activity because of the national lockdown. Now in this regard, the CMIE has indicated that rate of unemployment has increased from earlier 8.4% to 23.8% in March 2020 and this unemployment will further worsen in coming time. Now the point to be understood here is that the impact of unemployment will mostly fall on the informal sector or for those people who are engaged in the informal sectors of the Indian economy as well as for those people who are engaged as daily wage earners. Further, for such people, there has also been lack of social security net. Now, these people do not have access to public distribution system because of unavailability of ration cards. So, most of these people are outside the ambit of social welfare programs of the government. And because of this, even cash transfer for such people is not possible. Further, lack of social security as well as savings have forced them to travel back to their villages. So, because of this lack of social security and lack of any money, they have to travel back to their villages. And this traveling back has led them to greater chance of exposure to the virus. So, they have to fight on two fronts. First, on the front of their job as they are not able to keep their job. And second, on the front of fighting the virus. So, it is in this regard the author says that the condition of those people engaged in the informal sector are much bad as compared to those people who are engaged in the formal sector of the economy as well as those people who can work from home. Further, some migrants have even died while going back to their native villages. So overall, there is stark inequality between the haves as well as the have-nots. Or with respect to employment, those people who are engaged in the formal economy as well as those people who are engaged in the informal economy. Now coming to the second aspect of this discussion is poor response of the central government. Now here, the author highlights about two important aspects. First is insufficient cash transfer and the problems with the economic package announced recently by the central government worth rupees 20 lakh crore. Now with respect to the first aspect, the author has said that the government of India should have adopted a more welfare approach and should have transferred more cash to those who were in immediate need of such money. So in this regard, article says that the government should have come up with a higher cash transfer for the vulnerable and poor section of the population. Now coming to the second aspect, the author says that there has been problems with the economic package of this government. The author says that the principle followed for this economic package was minimum fiscal cost and minimum social spending. So it is here you can see that the government did not aim to spend much for social welfare program. So overall, one of the criticism of this package can be said to be that this package has not reduced immediate stress or fulfilled immediate needs of workers of the informal sector. And because of this lack of cash at their hand, most of these migrants are forced to travel back to their native places. Another criticism is that this package has focused more on reforms as well as privatization and less on social welfare as well as direct cash transfer for the poor and vulnerable section. So overall the article says that these reforms cannot be outrightly considered as measure to alleviate present economic crisis caused because of the coronavirus. And because of lack of job, the poor and the vulnerable sections of the population have left with no other choice but to travel back home. Now continuing from the above discussion, the third point becomes what should have been actually done by the central government. Now here the article says that the present economic crisis cause has been greatest since partition. So in this regard, the government of India should have shown a more compassionate approach with respect to relief measures for the workers employed in the informal sectors as they were the one who faced the brutal impact of the lockdown caused due to coronavirus. So in this regard, the author says that the government of India should have taken care of such sections of the population and could have adopted welfare program approach as adopted by the UK government as well as by the US government. Now the British government has come up with a policy of furlough program and this program is for such people whose job is at risk. Now furlough means temporary leave. So the government has asked the companies not to fire their employees but rather keep them on furlough or temporary leave rather than firing them. And if any workers has been kept on furlough then 80% of their salary of such workers would be paid by the UK government. Now, government of India could have adopted similar approach as that of a furlough program adopted by the United Kingdom. 
Further, even a capitalist country like United States has come up with a program known as Paycheck Protection Program. And this program ensures that the formal sector continues to keep their employees on their payroll and do not fire them. So, accordingly, the US government provides loan at cheaper rates to small-scale business entities as per the Paycheck Protection Program. And it also encourages the private sector to keep employees on their payroll and not to fire them. So in this regard, the article says that the government could have adopted a more welfare approach as a part of their policy measure, especially for the poor and vulnerable sections of the population. And accordingly, large amount of government expenditure should have been made immediately available for these poor and vulnerable section of the population. And this could have been done by identifying their BPL or APL card through their ration card, Aadhaar card or even their job card of MG Narega. So overall, this article has not only highlighted the stark inequality of poor and vulnerable section of the population, but has also stressed on those measures which the government of India should have adopted to meet the immediate needs of the poor and vulnerable section of the population. So this topic becomes important primarily from your mains perspective as it gets covered under GS Paper 2 as well as GS Paper 1. Under GS Paper 2, it gets covered under Welfare Schemes for Vulnerable Sections of the Population by Centre and States. And under GS Paper 1, it gets covered under Salient Features of Indian Society. The next news to be discussed appears on page number 9. It says, Finance Panel Flags Recovery Uncertainty. Members of the committee have wide variations of opinion in nominal GDP growth projections. So this news highlights about the viewpoints given by the members of Finance Commission whereby they have said that debt to GDP ratio for both center as well as state governments will increase. Further, they have also talked about nominal GDP to range from minus 6% to 1%. And this is because of lack of growth in the economy. Further, the commission said that in the medium term, the growth must come back to 8% else it will become problematic for the government with respect to increased borrowings. And further say that depending on the recovery of the economy, it is yet to be seen whether the recovery takes V-shape recovery or a U-shape recovery. Further, the members of commission also endorsed centers reform to increase borrowing limit of states from the present 3% to 5%. And this percentage is with respect to states' gross state domestic product. However, the increase in borrowing limits of states from central government is conditional. That is, certain conditions have been attached with respect to increase in states' borrowing. So in this regard, both these aspects becomes important from our prelims perspective. That is debt to GDP ratio as well as nominal GDP or nominal gross domestic product. So in this regard, it's important to understand certain basic facts with respect to increase in debt to GDP ratio either of the central government or that of the state governments. Now, debt to GDP ratio can be said to be the difference between production as well as debt of a government. And this is expressed as a percentage. In other terms, it is also expressed in number of years required for any government to pay back their debt. So, the more number of years which is needed by any government to pay back their debt increases the debt to GDP ratio of a particular country. And country having high debt to GDP ratio will have difficulties in paying off their debts. So, in this regard, having a higher debt to GDP ratio is not considered good. Further, creditors seek higher interest rate while lending to such countries who have higher debt to GDP ratio. So overall we can say that higher debt to GDP ratio indicates higher risk of default for any government. And in this regard it's also to be noted that even international rating agencies such as Fitch, S&P, Moody's also consider debt to GDP ratio as one of the conditions in order to downgrade rating. So if a country has a higher debt to GDP ratio then the rating can be downgraded by the international rating agencies. Now with respect to nominal GDP which is calculated at current market price, the members of finance commission has said that it might range between minus 6% to 1% and this is because of lack of any growth or inflation in the economy. Now in this regard you should also know that real GDP is calculated as per the base year price and the base year is considered as 2011-12 as of now and it is also referred as a constant price. Now with respect to V-shaped recovery or a U-shaped recovery, generally recovery in the short term is considered as a V-shaped recovery, whereas recovery in the medium term to long term is considered as a U-shaped recovery. Now it's important to understand that because of large scale disruption 
as well as intensity of the disruption caused because of covid-19 situation the economy will limp back in medium to long term so we will mostly see a u shaped recovery of our economy however it is yet to be seen that how the economy actually recovers in the short term medium term as well as in the longer term so the finance commission has said that additional expenditure both at center and state will substantially increase debt burdens for both center as well as states and it will end up increasing the debt to gdp ratio for both center as well as states now despite the increase in debt to gdp ratio the member panel has said that linking this increased borrowing of states from the center will further strengthen the fiscal architecture of the economy will further strengthen the fiscal architecture so the member panel said that the stimulus package provided by the central government is mainly aimed at the medium term growth and this may not have any immediate effect on the economy because the focus here by the central government was on a long term structural growth and these structural growths pertains to sectors such as defense space coal and mining etc as more privatization has been allowed in these different sectors further the commission said that the nominal gdp for 2021 could range between minus 6 to 1% because of lack of growth in the economy so it is yet to be seen that how the economy recovers in the medium to long term that is within 3 to 5 years further the commission also said that government should substantially increase health expenditure from the current 0.9% of gdp so these can be said to be some of the recommendations of the finance commission with respect to increased borrowings by center as well as state so overall the members of panel has highlighted that despite the borrowing has increased it augurs well as these borrowings are more in fiscal nature and are more aimed at structural reforms so this topic becomes important primarily from the perspective of your prelims examination with respect to indian economy and in your mains gets covered under gs paper 2 as well as gs paper 3 under gs paper 3 it gets covered with respect to various aspect of indian economy and under gs paper 2 with respect to appointment to various constitutional post and also functions and responsibilities of various constitutional bodies now the next news which we will discuss appears in the archive section on page number 7 of the hindu newspaper now this particular news which appeared 100 years ago talked about the criticism with respect to government of india act 1919 now government of india act 1919 can be said to be a political reform for indians specifically with respect to executive federal as well as legal framework Now according to the British government this act was a step forward with respect to progressive realization of responsible government however it was rejected by congress so in this regard this particular article which appeared 100 years ago mentioned about certain criticism of government of india act 1919 especially with respect to certain rules of business now this particular act becomes very important for us from our upsc perspective both from the perspective of prelims examination as well as our mains examination so we understand that these political reforms becomes important and each step of these political reforms with respect to different government of india acts must be understood in its entirety now with respect to government of india act 1919 any person famously quoted that this act is unworthy of england to offer and india to accept now such statements can either be asked in the prelims examination or even a question can be framed in the mains examination now this quote may be asked in your mains examination with respect to highlighting the features of government of india act or even with respect to its criticism so in this regard let us go through some of the important highlight or important features of government of india act 1919 now as already mentioned that this topic becomes important from your prelims perspective from the perspective of history as well as polity and governance So this particular question was asked in the year 2016 the question was Montague Chelmsford proposals were related to options were social reforms educational reforms reforms in police administration and constitutional reforms in this the correct answer is constitutional reforms now another question was asked in the year 2012 the question was distribution of powers between center and states in the indian constitution is based on the scheme provided in options are morlemento reforms 1999 B Montague Chelmsford Act 1919 C Government of India Act 1935 and D Indian Independence Act 1947 So here the correct answer is Government of India Act 1935 So these different Government of India Acts as well as 
political reforms undertaken by these different act becomes important from our examination perspective. So in this regard, let us go through some of the salient features of Government of India Act 1919. Now, as we have already discussed that Government of India Act was codified version of Montague Chelmsford reforms. Now, Edwin Charles Montague was the Secretary of State and Lord Chelmsford was the Viceroy of British India. So the 1919 Act was promised to Indians as a step in the progressive realization of responsible government in India as an integral part of the British Empire. However, this act was aptly rejected by the Indian National Congress. So in this regard, the preamble to the Government of India Act 1919 mentioned about the gradual introduction of responsible government in India. It said that whereas it is the declared policy of parliament to provide for increasing association of Indians in every branch of Indian administration and also for the gradual development of self-governing institutions with a view to the progressive realization of responsible government in British India as an integral part of the empire. So this aspect of the preamble of Government of India Act 1919 becomes important for us to understand from our prelims perspective. So according to the preamble, the purpose of this act was progressive realization of responsible government in British India as an integral part of the British Empire. So this must be remembered from your prelims perspective. Further, let us understand about the central government as was provided through this act. With respect to the executive, it said that there were two lists for administration, central and provincial. Out of the six members of Viceroy's executive council, three were to be Indian members. So this was an addition of the Government of India Act 1919. Now with respect to legislative changes, it said a bicameral legislature was introduced for the first time. So it had two houses, Central Legislative Assembly, which later became our Lok Sabha and Council of State, which later became our Rajya Sabha. And also it introduced for the very first time a system of direct elections in the country. However, the electorates for these direct elections were very limited because the franchise was based on property, tax, as well as education. And in those times, there were very few Indians who were educated, who had property, and who used to pay their taxes. So this, in a way, limited the scope of electoral franchisee provided to Indians under the Government of India Act 1919. So as per the Act, general elections were held in British India in 1920 to elect members of the Imperial Legislative Council and Provincial Councils. And they can be said to be the first election in country's modern history where Indians also participated, although in a limited way. Now, for a bill to become an act, it had to be passed by both houses of the parliament, just like today, and had to be approved by the Viceroy. However, in those times, Viceroy had more discretionary powers as compared to the discretionary powers as of now enjoyed by our president. Now, moving to the provincial level here. The governor was the executive head of the province, just like today. And for the first time, diarchy was introduced in states. Now here, the subjects were divided into two lists, namely reserved list and transferred list. And here, the governor was in charge of the subjects under reserved list with his executive counselors. So the subjects under reserved list was under the governor. Whereas ministers were in charge of subjects under the transferred list. And the subjects included under the transferred list were education, local government, health, excise, industry, public works, religious endowments, etc. Now let us go through this particular question asked by UPSC in the year 2013. With reference to Indian history, the members of constituent assembly from the provinces were A. Directly elected by the people of those provinces B. Nominated by the Indian National Congress and Muslim League C elected by the provincial legislative assemblies and D selected by the government for their expertise in constitutional matters. In this, the correct answer is C. They were elected by the provincial legislative assemblies. Now moving further with respect to legislature, it says that size of the provincial legislative assemblies was increased and now about 70% of the members were elected. There were communal and class electorates and some women could also vote based on the extremely qualified electoral franchise. So these can be said to be the changes introduced at the provincial level. So moving further with respect to other salient features, we can say that the 1919 Act provided for the first time establishment of a public service commission in India, which later became the Union Public Service Commission after the Indian Constitution came into being. 
So as per the act, a Central Public Service Commission was set up in 1926 to recruit civil servants in the country. Another important aspect to be remembered is that the 1919 Act extended the principle of communal representation by providing separate electorates for Sikhs, Indian Christian, Anglo-Indians, Europeans, other than Muslims. So the communal electorate already existed for the Muslims and in the Government of India Act 1919, the communal electorate was enlarged or extended. And these were extended for Sikhs, Indian Christians, Anglo-Indians as well as Europeans. So here it must be understood that Government of India Act 1919 did not introduce the communal electorate. It was already earlier as per the Government of India Act 1909. Now another important feature is that this act introduced a clause whereby it mentioned about reviewing the act itself after a period of 10 years. And accordingly, after a period of 10 years, Simon Commission was introduced to review the Government of India Act 1919. So it says that the act provided that after 10 years, a statutory commission would be set up to study the working of the government and this resulted in the formation of Simon Commission of 1927. Further, the 1919 Act also created an Office of High Commissioner for India in London. So these can be said to be other salient features with respect to Government of India Act 1919. So after understanding that, let us go through this question asked in the year 2012. The question says, which of the following is are the principal features of Government of India Act 1919? First, introduction of diarchy in the executive government of the provinces. Yes, this is correct. Introduction of a separate communal electorates for Muslim. No, this is incorrect. As we have already seen that the separate electorate for Muslims already existed prior to the coming of Government of India Act 1919. The Government of India Act 1919 enlarged the communal electorate to, to other sections of the society. Third, devolution of legislative authority by the centre to the provinces. Yes, this is also correct. So here the correct answer is C, that is 1 and 3 only. So after understanding some of the salient features of the Act, let us go through some of the issues highlighted with respect to Government of India Act 1919. The first is furtherance of communal electorate. Now the extension or furtherance of communal electorate further fragmented the Indian society on the basis of religion. So Government of India Act 1919 in a way provided for more fragmentation of the Indian society on religious lines as it helped the British to follow the principle of appeasement especially to the Muslim League. Another problem can be said to be the extremely limited franchisee based on education, tax as well as property. So the common people were mostly excluded from their voting rights as they were not educated, they did not have property and did not file tax. So it says that the common people did not have any right to vote as the right to vote was limited to only a privileged class of citizens who were educated and were wealthy. And moreover, these privileged class were always pro-British. So the real power of franchisee through democracy never occurred. Now another problem or another concern was with respect to extensive powers given to the Viceroy. Now he had the power to enact a bill even without legislature's consent. Now compare this power with respect to the present power of the president to move an ordinance. Now even though the ordinance is promulgated by the president, it has to be passed by both Lok Sabha as well as Rat Sabha. However, during those times, the Viceroy had the power to enact a bill even without legislature's consent. So he had the authority even to undermine the parliament. Further, allocation of seats for central legislature was not based on population but on the importance of provinces in the eyes of the British. So allocation of seat in the parliament was more of a prerogative for the British. So overall we can say that the seats in the parliament was not based on population as it is now. So these can be said to be some of the concerns with respect to the Government of India Act 1919. Now as you can see number of questions have been asked by UPSC on Government of India Act 1919. And today this news has appeared specifically in the archive section with respect to criticism of the particular act. So in your prelims examinations, questions can be asked from the perspective of modern history and also from the perspective of polity with respect to salient features of Government of India Act 1919. Now the next news appears on page number 15. It says, pet recycling units seek permission to import. Generation of bottle scraps falls sharply. And this is because there has been decline in consumption of pet bottles within the country. So as per this news, the recycling units in India have asked for permission from the central government to import washed pet bottle flakes. 
Now PET stands for polyethylene terephthalate and it is a form of polyester just like clothing fabric. Further it says that it is extruded or molded into plastic bottles and containers for packaging foods and beverage industry, for personal care products and many other consumer products. Further, PET is a polymer of ethylene glycol and terephthalic acid. So pellets of PET resin are heated to molten liquid which then can be easily extruded or molded into almost any shape. When PET is used for fiber or fabric applications, it is usually referred to as polyester and when PET is used for container and packaging applications, it is typically called PET or PET resin. So here you must understand that when PET is used for fiber or fabric applications, it is usually referred as polyester and when it is used for container and packaging applications, then it is typically called PET resin. It further says that PET is a highly valued packaging material because, because it is strong and lightweighted non-reactive, economical as well as shatterproof and it is also safe for food, beverage, personal care, pharmaceutical as well as medical industry. So considering the importance of PET bottle, Government of India had banned the import of plastic flakes and lumps which were made from washing and cutting plastic waste. This was done to speed up recycling of plastic waste within the country as these companies prefer to import these plastic flakes as well as lumps because they were cheaper for them to import. So it is in this regard the recycling units have again asked for permission of the central government to allow for import of these PET recycling units. So in this topic you must know about PET that is polyethylene terephthalate and its various uses with respect to different industries such as food and beverage industry, pharmaceutical industry, personal product industry etc. And from your prelims perspective, this topic gets covered under general science. Now after our discussion, this forms your question for the day. The question is match the following pairs. And these pairs are with respect to mountain pass and state or union territories. 1. Karakoram Pass, Ladakh. 2nd. Nathula Pass, Sikkim. 3rd. Lipu Lake Pass, Nagaland. And 4th. Zorjila Pass, Arunachal Pradesh. So the question is select the correct pair from the code given below. Options are A. 1 and 3 only. B. 2 and 4 only. C 2 and 3 only and D 1 and 2 only. Now coming to the answer of yesterday, the question was No Creek Biosphere Reserve is located on which of the following? Options were Garo Hills, Kase Hills, Jaintia Hills and Rengma Hills. Here the correct answer is A that is Garo Hills.